I know this sounds not sincere, but everybody down there is trying to do the, be the best they can. State Senator Steve Swadzinski takes measure of his first session ever in St. Paul. I was for this bill. The let me this is Democratic out. Visions. Here's producer Jeff Strait. We have with us now Senator Steve Swazinski, District 48, Eden Prairie, southern half of Minnetonka. Steve just completed his first half session in St. Paul. How did it go? Great. Uh, it exceeded my expectations. Uh, I think I taught American government and American history for over 30 years, and I loved every minute of it. And I, I think I found something I love as much. If I could go back and tell my students, I told them that um, laws are like sausages. Um, you should never watch them being made. Yeah, yeah. Famous quote by Bismarck. And now I would like to retract that statement. And um, I've come up with this. Laws are like cake. Um, it requires a great deal of time and energy and effort, but every step of the way is worthy of your attention because um, I just really, truly enjoyed the lawmaking process. How was it different than you thought it might be? I, th um, I didn't realize the hours would be like what they were. That was, came as a surprise to me. Um, I tell my wife, um, I'll be home at 6, and I'd come walking in the door at 9, 9.30, those late nights. Sure. Just, uh, um, they were, that was hard. That was just, you, it was different. It wasn't okay. a hassle or anything, but, um, and then the session, um, the special session, we went two nights around the clock and, um, that surprised me. I'd heard stories over the years, you know, that special sessions can go around the clock, but to experience that was something I wasn't ready for. Not that much fun then, huh? Well, it was because it was unique. It was so, different. Yeah. It was a new experience yeah. and... And, and you knew that um, good work was getting done. And a lot of it was behind the scenes, but ultimately we'll work on that and maybe hopefully next session we'll finish on time. Now, you have to deal with a lot of different legislators when you have a seat in the Senate, members of the House as well as the Senate. What is the collegiality like uh, between, say, the Democrats and the Republicans in the Senate? I know this sounds not sincere, but everybody down there is trying to do the, be the best they can right, yeah. and trying to make Minnesota a better place. And um, they're just nice people. They're all like men and women in the same club that are just trying to do their job and do it well. And I, I just, everybody I met was just a really nice person. And uh, you were visited by lobbyists occasionally? A lot. A lot. In January, uh, February, and March is generally when they were coming to the door. And so, I mean, we don't want to generalize. Lobbyists are a necessity, and they serve a very important function. But um, what did you learn about their profession and your role as a senator? Um, I learned that, it's like you said, they're a necessary commodity in democracy in the 21st century. They're there to educate me. And um, in one day in particular, um, I'm glad you asked this because it was an interesting hour. I had a group of people that were against um, immunization and they came into my office right there in that peak of 31 people um, mm -hmm. developed measles and they were telling me that that's not the role of government is you know mandating immunization and, and measles shots and that's something I'm, um, I favor. And yet they were convincing and articulate and insightful and told me how that's not the proper role of government. And when they left, I was like, wow, it's a viewpoint I never thought before. And right after they left, I met with some people from the Boundary Waters that were all about, I don't remember if it was polymet or twin metals, but one of those two, that we shouldn't be building it and here's what's going to happen if they do. And it, and it was, um, and that meeting was something I do believe in. Mm -hmm. And so it was just hour of my life where I got to listen to two sides try to persuade me how to vote on a bill and it was it's part of my job now and I any special colleagues you want to point out in the Senate to... no they're all great <laughs> I if said, anybody I oh, name yeah. would feel bad that I didn't name the other person the teacher is learning a lesson uh, already yeah. huh? okay. and, but there are some people there yeah. with such high moral um, compasses okay. um, they're a pleasure to ask, um, so what are you thinking on this next vote? 
and because I know their vote has been well thought out and, and, and morally um, centered. Well, given the almost 50-50 balance in the Senate now between DFL and GOP, every vote obviously really counts a lot. Yeah, you don't want to miss a day of work. No, you don't. <laughs> now, there was a, uh, one bill that you authored, uh, Senate File 1061, and it would require more civics teaching in high schools. Tell me about it. That's your area, right? It's my, it's my baby, so to speak. Okay. That's the one thing. If I can get that accomplished in my tenure in the state Senate, I, I, I feel really proud of that. Now, we're going to make you do much more than well, that. Well, I, okay. I hope I do. Uh, but yeah, the one maybe. thing, um, right now government is not um, three and a half credits in social studies is required mm -hmm. to graduate from high school. But And then the suggestion is these are some classes that may be necessary. And Article 13 of the state constitution reads something like um, a Republican form of government de be depending, dependent mainly upon the intelligence of the people. Yeah. It is the duty of the state senate and legislature and the house to create a general and uniform system of public schools. And so when I get those phone calls from constituents that ask me, um, is the congressman busy? Or people say to me, so are you flying to Washington, D.C. every week then? Mm -hmm. And that's when I know this class needs to be required. Yeah. Because there's a lot of people out there, young and old, that don't know we have a Klobuchar and Franken, and we have a Lori Pryor, Jennifer Loon, um, Steve Swadzinski in the state Senate, or the state you know, the legislature, and, and Eric Paulson. They just don't know there's these different bodies. And having taught American government for all those years, I just know... Um, it's a class that we should be requiring to graduate. No, it di didn't become law this nope. year. Nope, it no. never made it out of committee because we, the, um, the, the protagonist couldn't agree on what a credit is, nope. believe it or not. Well, That's sure. what it came uh, down to, what is a credit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. But laws do take a number of years in many instances, yep. don't they? I mean, you know, you got to nurse something from one session to the next to the next. And pretty soon, if you hang in there, it's going to happen for you, if it's a good law. I think it's a good law, and I, thank I, you I do, for I do too. telling me to be patient. I, I, I'm an old poli-sci <laughs> guy myself, and uh, I'm learning stuff every day about our government. And it pays to know how things work. Good job. Thank you. Um, we're going to keep working on it. What other bills were you uh, uh, particularly active in supporting this? It, you know, I became, uh, I think, uh, an extremist when it came to uh, any laws or bills that were, was, were cutting into the water quality. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's something I, I'm kind of becoming, um, what Goldwater say, extremism and, and um, defense of liberty is no vice. And I would add extremism and defense of clean water is equally no vice And because our, our water supply is precious and we need it. 80% of our bodies are water. I don't want to mess with it. So. You, you spent most of your youth not <clears throat> far from the St. Louis River estuary. That no goes, kidding. And U.S. Steel used to have a big plant up there. can remember as a kid, those big signs in Billings Park uh, in, on the river, yeah. do, swimming at your own risk, because not because of <laughs> safe, because uh, of the water quality. Yeah. On the Minnesota side, uh, uh, the, a great uh, legislator, Willard Munger, yeah. fought long and hard to clean up the St. Louis River. They're still cleaning it up. Well, now the sediment, they're trying to figure out how can we dredge it without dredging up Ooh, all these chemicals yeah. lying on the bottom. I have some lovely videos of that. Oh, it's it's going to be a hard, hard to sail. What else did you take back from uh, the session? Education is the other issue. Yeah. I think um, the 2%, 2 percent, two percent increase in educational funding on the formula is wonderful news, um, <clears throat> but it still doesn't keep up with inflation. Mm -hmm. And so there's some good stuff in the bill for our children, but there's some really bad this stuff that um, came out of the budget um, for there teachers. Teacher and I really, I lobbied against it. I spoke against it on the floor. Shortage. And one of the things was to, um, making it easier um, to get your teaching license and community experts could now come into the classroom and they wouldn't have to join the salary schedule or be part of collective bargaining. Yeah. <laughs> so anybody that's been following what's going on in Wisconsin with education can kind of see a similar progression happening 
um, before our eyes. And they also got rid of, um, allowed districts to negotiate um, contracts um, and last in, first out um, variables without considering seniority, um, which is another thing I think is going to maybe lead to a path to Wisconsin. Now, Senator, we had a, a double homicide, a tragedy in my part of Eden Prairie a yeah. few weeks ago, and you have some uh, compelling comments about that. Um, last September, October, I was door knocking with my daughter, and uh, we came to this house, and this gentleman comes to the door, and he goes, SWAT, how you doing? And I go, hi, and do I know you? And he goes, oh my God, yeah, I'm the bus driver for Eden Prairie that takes you on your trips to Washington, D.C. when you take kids. And right away, I, I recognized him at that point. I go, how you doing? He goes, there's somebody here I want you to meet. And he yells for his son. And this father comes to the, the father is standing there with such pride, and he was all upright and firm and just like, my son is home from a halfway house. And his son starts telling his story that he's been in and out of trouble, chemical dependency issues, and he's struggling, but now he's turning things around and he's, he's home for the day from the halfway house because he's earned that, that privilege, so mm -hmm. to speak, to be able to go on a home visit to see his mom and his dad. And the dad's just so proud of his son that this time he's going to overcome um, the obstacles that he's had in life. And with meth and opiate addiction. And so my daughter, who works at Hazleton, started weighing in and visiting with them about things that she knows about. Your so, very own daughter. Yeah, and so there was this common connection with her um, door knocking with me and, find, and meeting somebody that might be, you know, asking her a couple questions about um, how, to, how to make this a permanent life change and, for him. And, so it was just this, and the next couple of days, everybody I talked to, I told them, oh, because the, the kid was an ex-student of mine. So the dad's the bus driver, and the kid's the ex-student of mine, and he just wanted to know, let me know how he's turning his life around after years yeah. of, of addiction. So I leave, I tell people about this amazing experience, door knocking, um, and just how, you know, meeting people and it, we're, we're all just people and we all got stories to tell and some aren't good and, but hopefully everybody's you know when they're struggling and uh, we help them up and so lo and behold two weeks ago now i pick up the paper and um double homicide and and i went oh boy and the young man his demons continued to chase him and he went to his father's and mother's house and um and um murdered him and I guess I don't even know why I'm telling you this story other than uh, we as a community, I don't, I'm not pointing fingers, I'm not blaming, I'm not blaming the child, I'm not blaming the parent, I'm not blaming the halfway house, I'm not blaming anybody, but society, we've got an opiate and a, and a meth a, a problem in our society, and if we don't get a handle on this thing, um, we got to take care of each other, and, and um, I don't know if we're doing a very good job at that right now. And, and I know that we need more counselors in our schools. And so you're backing legislation so high schools can have more counselors. Yes, to and deal we, with drugs. And, and, we yeah. need more counselors. What are we? 48th in the nation, Minnesota is in high school to counselor ratios. I think we're a little bit better in Eden Prairie, Minnetonka, but nonetheless, that's nothing to be proud of. 48th in the nation. Yeah. And a few years ago, a member of my family um, was in Hazleton treatment, and my wife and I went on the family program, and we and and we spent four days there life-changing stories and experiences and I couldn't wait to meet the chemical dependency counselor at Eden Prairie High School which I was still teaching at the time and tell him about this experience I just had and I met my friend in the counseling department I said hey where's the chemical dependency counselor right now and she said we laid him off because um, there's no funding for his program unbelievable and um, yeah. I'll be a co-sponsor I'll write any bill that will help us get this opiate crisis under control because it's an epidemic. Senator Swadzinski wants to hear from you about the opiate addiction crisis. Contact Steve at 651-296-1314 or on Facebook. That's 651-296-1314 or via Facebook. Now you've been very busy. How are you keeping in touch with your constituents or are they just keeping in touch with you. Um, social media is. Um, I'm a, I'm a 58 year old guy, okay. and um, but 
I'm learning a lot about how effective it is. And it is a very effective tool to keep um, the citizens, the constituents informed on the issues. And I think we've been doing a really good job at that. And I get to give um, a shout out to the, the, the people that help you at the state legislature, sure. the media people and um, who do make me look like George Clooney, um, the research <laughs> people and the legislative assistants. There are a bunch, predominantly people in their 20s and 30s with so much youthful enthusiasm that they just, just to, they fuel you, you know, and make sure. you want to do a better job. And uh, so they're helping me a lot with social media. And then I've had two town hall forums that um, one was, um, I did with Lori Pryor, and we had about 120 people. Wow, that's so, pretty good. Yeah, I, I felt very good about that. That one. was earlier in the session? Yeah, maybe February 5th, somewhere okay. in there. Sure. And then we um, both had separate ones in the last um, four weeks, sure. or maybe... 30 people showed up at each of those, but yeah. it's gotten a lot nicer. Um, the weather has. People are thinking, planting, going boating and yeah, fishing. Yeah, and right, planting yeah. flowers. So they're telling you around the Senate that you're kind of looking like George Clooney? Well, I haven't heard it in the Senate yet, but okay. yes, I've heard it from my wife. So the crew around here, uh, you're instructing them to refer to you as George Clooney? Yes, yeah. I am. Well, George, meet Brad Pitt. <laughs> nice to meet you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for being with us. Okay, you're welcome. That's good. Democratic Visions is handcrafted by volunteers from Eden Prairie, Hopkins, Minnetonka, Edina, and Bloomington. Watch us on select cable systems and on our YouTube channel. This is Carol Sundstrom.